Can you hear me now? Yes. Is Isaiah 43, 10 through 13. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant who I am chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and apart from me there is no Savior. I have revealed and saved and proclaimed, I and not some foreign God among you, you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, that I am God. Yes, and from ancient days I am He. No one can deliver out of my hand. When I act, who can reverse it? Second reading is Acts 1, 8 through 11. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on to you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After this, after he said this, he was taken up before, my, before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, Why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, who who has been taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. There are children's church today. Okay, let's start with prayer. Father, thank you for the opportunity to come and hear your word. Father, may we listen. May you reveal what you would have us to hear today, Father, and help us to apply it to our lives. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the fact that we know that it is true, that it has stood the test of time. And Father, we just thank you for calling out to us to speak to us, to not be a foreign alien God, but a God that wants to reveal himself and show himself to his people. We just thank you for that and praise your holy name. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So today is called Dare to Be Like Barnabas. And I also said after that the Barnabas experiment, and I'll explain that a little further. You might think, why are we spending so much time in Acts or with Barnabas? You could spend a lot more time in Barnab- with Barnabas if you wanted to in Acts. It's the developing, first developing of the church, and there's so many things that you can learn there. And Barnabas is one sometime that gets overlooked because he fell into Paul's shadow. But that was intentional because God wanted to use Paul. Because Paul was someone who was being used so much in the opposite way that he was killing and destroying the church. And God said, listen, you're going to be my instrument. So we sometimes kind of forget about seeing who Barnabas was. Barnabas was a man that repented and he truly laid down his idols. He didn't pick them up anymore. He put them out of the way. He didn't let life stand in the way and keep him from serving God. He be, totally became a new creation in Christ, and he was satisfied with that identity in Christ. He was humble. He sought after God's approval rather than man's approval. He was generous. He did things for the right reasons, and he didn't expect anything in return for them. He knew what service meant. He served not only God, but he served others with all of his heart. And he stood up for them. He was willing, available, reliable, and dedicated to serving God and to others. He was filled with the Spirit. Spirit, The Scriptures say that he was full of faith, and to to his faith he added goodness. He gave others opportunity, and he helped train them, not only in word, but he led them in actions as well. And he was encouraging. He was trustworthy, and he finished what he was started. He could be counted on. He was obedient to God. He finished what he started. He didn't give up. And that's tough sometimes. Sometimes we get down and out. But he knew the secret to that. He continually went to God's Word. He fasted and he prayed. And he let the Spirit fill him up, revive him, and use him. He relied on God for his strength, not his own might. And he gave God all the glory. He was a man of second chances. Just like God gives us second chances and third chances. We have grace. 
grace by which we can be saved rather than condemned. No matter what we've done, no matter how many times we do it, God will still give us the gift of grace if we'll only receive it. He trained up churches and he left leadership in the places of churches that he set up. And he went back and checked on them. He was truly a man that we ought to look at as an example. Give him a little more scrutiny and see what makes this man tick. He also inspired and he launched mighty men that we hear more of. Paul and then John Mark who went on to write Mark. Wow, he was a superhero of the faith. You didn't see him as a superhero. You saw him more as a sidekick because he didn't try to go after any of the glory or anything. He wanted to train up what he saw in others and let them take the spotlight if necessary. It didn't matter to him. The only thing that mattered to him was the growth of the gospel message and serving Jesus Christ with all of his heart. Hebrews 13, 7 says, Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. And that's what I want to try to do today is see what made Barnabas tick. How can we imitate that and apply that to our lives? So that's the name of today's message. Dare to be like Barnabas. Second part of it, the Barnabas exper- experiment. So what is an experiment? An experiment is a test in which you perform a series of actions and carefully observe their effects in order to learn about something. Or something that you do to see how well or how badly it works. So we're going to study Barnabas and then hopefully apply some of the things that he did in his ministry to our own lives, to our own service, and see what the outcome and results could be. If we all dare to be like Barnabas, what could the outcomes of our lives in this church be? If we read his story, you see tremendous growth. And when you're reading through Acts, you see that there was growth, persecution, more growth and more boldness. And all throughout, you see where their numbers were added to immeasurably. God was working in that church. And He's the same God today that wants to work in this church the same way. The same Spirit that empowers us to do mighty, wondrous things. Nothing has changed there. So let's look at Barnabas a little bit. And we're going to do a lot of reading, so you can grab your Bibles or we'll follow along on the screen. But what I'm going to do is take you through Acts again, talking about Barnabas. And we might have read these things before, but as we read them, the Holy Spirit will reveal more and more to us. So in Acts 4, verse 34 through 37, it's the first time that we hear about Barnabas or Joseph. It's not the first time that the disciples recognized who he was, and I'll tell you more about that in just a second. Starting in verse 34, there was no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone as he had need. Now here's where he comes on the scene. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Well, the first part of the story, Barnabas' story, and anyone's story that wants to know God is repentance. You can't have a life in God unless you repent and turn to Him. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is who He said He was? The Scriptures clearly say that He was the Son of God. The Scriptures clearly say that God would send His Son to die for us. Jesus was who He said He was. The world today wants to try to disregard that and say He was a great prophet or He achieved salvation. Jesus Christ was and is God Almighty. And He came to this earth and humbled Himself, gave up His throne in heaven to die for you and I. And that's the first step. You've got to realize that. And if you do realize that, not have just a head knowledge, but a heart knowledge to say, thank you, God, for doing that for me. What an awesome thing. And I repent of my sins and turn from my wicked ways and accept Jesus Christ's gift of salvation. Because I can't reach God on my own. You can't reach God on your own. Jesus Christ was blameless, spotless. He was God, perfect in every way. And He took all of our sins and shame upon Him so that we could be free. We could have mercy and grace instead of judgment and condemnation. So the first step is repentance. And if you haven't done that, that needs to be the first step you take. Come see me, come see Lowell, come see anyone that you see the Spirit of God in and they'll tell you how to become saved. That's the first step. But so many times, as Christians, we kind of stop there. 
we have our salvation. We have our fire insurance. The next steps are so much harder. Giving up things and living a life that glorifies God, it's tough. But if you truly repented and truly meant that, then you should want to live that life. And Barnabas can give us some examples of how to do that. He can give us some encouragement, just as he encouraged the disciples. Don't get stuck. Live a life that brings glory and honor to God. Barnabas repented from a pure heart, and we've talked about that before. His heart was pure, and he wanted to wholly, wholeheartedly serve God. He didn't worry about the things he had. So what did he do? He sold his land. It says in the Scriptures, it says, some of them sold land and homes. I don't know if Barnabas sold land and homes. It only says land. Maybe he had a home also. But what he did was he got rid of the things on this earth that tied him down from serving God. He had to rely on God for his needs. He not only sold what he had, his land where he had a place to go for refuge, possibly a house with a roof over his head, he sold that and didn't have it anymore. And besides not having it, he gave it away. He gave it away so that others could have things that they needed, as the apostles saw fit. So now he had nothing. He was homeless. He had to depend on God for all of his needs. Maybe that's a tough thing to do, but maybe that's an awesome thing to do at the same time because then you have to rely on God. And guess what? He will supply your needs as we see. He chose to serve God wholeheartedly. So he repented, turned from his ways, sold everything he had, and relied on the Spirit to fill him, to guide him, to give him what he needed in life. And the disciples recognize this. We see that from the passage. They recognize that before he sold the land, because it starts out and says who he was. He was the son of encouragement to the disciples. That means he was living a godly life before he ever performed this act. I don't know what things he did because the Scriptures don't say. But he was living in such an example that the men that followed and walked and talked with Jesus were encouraged by him. I don't know about you, but that's a pretty strong statement. So this was just another act that he did, just icing on the cake. He followed God wholeheartedly. And he was encouraging. The disciples recognized this and they called him that. That was his superhero name, Son of Encouragement, because he was encouraging. Well, if you look back and look at older uh, meanings of the word, the Greek word behind it is consolation instead of encouragement. And that's the same word that is used in John 14, 16. If you're not familiar with that, that's when Jesus Christ said that he must go. And the reason that he must go is that the Father would send the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, the Holy Spirit to us, to empower us and give us everything that we need. That's what Barnabas is being compared to, the same type of consolation that the Holy Spirit gives us. Another word could be uh, comforter. The name truly means one who is called to stand next to. A comforter is one who stands next to you in time of sorrow or need. A counselor is one who stands beside of you to guide or lead you. And an encourager is one who stands next to you in all circumstances. That's who Barnabas was. He truly exemplified the Holy Spirit in his life. He was baptized with the Holy Spirit, and then he let the Holy Spirit fill him again and again and again. And he let the Holy Spirit use him. The next time we read about Barnabas is about four years later. That's in Acts 9. And Saul has been converted. Saul is no longer one who is persecuting Christians, but he is one who's going to lead the battle for the Christian cause. And we read about him in Acts 9, verses 26 through 28. When we came to Jerusalem... When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples. And we're talking about Saul. But they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him. And how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus. Barnabas was a son of encouragement. He had a good reputation, and he staked it all on the line for someone who was killing and destroying Christians, who had put fear into the hearts of the twelve disciples. But he stood up for him. What did he see different that they didn't see? How much more in tune was he 
with the Spirit of God than they possibly were. And I'm not saying they weren't by any means. But he saw something, and he wasn't afraid. And not only was he not afraid, but he stood up and put his reputation on the line. What if he was wrong? If he was wrong, he might have went off with Paul, and Paul might have just killed him right there on the spot. He put his life on the line for this new convert. He saw something. He was led by the Spirit, whatever the reasons were. But he gave Paul a chance. And he went to the disciples, and he was the one that was so encouraging that he got them to believe that it was okay. And as you see in the verses that he moved, Paul moved about, Saul moved about freely as a result of that. They had no fear left after Barnabas stood up for him. How many times have we needed to stand up for someone? Have we done it or did we not do it? Did we ask for God's guidance in the matter? It was God's plan all along, His story, to use Saul in a mighty way. And Barnabas was the only one that recognized this and stood up for him. Barnabas was truly encouraging. He staked everything, not just a little bit, but he staked everything, including his life, on the line. Well, now about eight more years have passed, and we skip to Acts 11. And we start in verse 22. News of this reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. There was an awakening in the Christian community. Not something that they had never seen or experienced before. And they wanted to see what was going on. So who did they send? Barnabas. Wouldn't that be awesome? If you were that encouraging in everything in your ministry, that when there was something great happening, that the church recognized and said, we need to send you. What an awesome thing that would be. That's how much they had faith in Barnabas. Not only that he would be encouraging, but he would see God's will. That he would get the job done. So they sent him off. What had to be the elements that were there for him to do that? Well, first of all, he had to be available, didn't he? He had to be spirit-filled. He had to be trustworthy. He had to be dependable. And he had to be willing. He had all of those character traits. So off he went. Verse 23, When he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and did what? What his name says. He encouraged them all to remain true in the Lord with all their hearts. And that wasn't an easy task in those days because if you were a Christian, that means that people weren't going to support your business. That means you were an outcast. That means that Saul might come running looking for you, except he's converted now, and kill you. But that still didn't mean that the church, not the church, the Jews in the synagogue were not going to still persecute you. You had to be fearful for your life if you were a Christian. We don't understand that. We come to church and we think somebody down the road might say, hmm, that's one of those Christians. That's the worst thing that's really going to happen to us, right? Sticks and stones may break our bones. But they literally could have their bones broken. They could have their skulls literally smashed in with a stone. And they didn't fear. And Barnabas encouraged them. He was in tune with the Spirit and he saw the evidence of God's grace. And he wanted others to follow his example. So he didn't just preach it, he lived it as well. Moving on to verse 24, it says, He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And a great number of people were brought to the Lord. He knew what the key was. Paul talks about it. He says it were a vessel. Barnabas was the vessel that the Holy Spirit used. It wasn't about Barnabas. It was about God moving through him, doing mighty works and mighty wonders through the Holy Spirit. He had faith, and from that faith, the Holy Spirit gave him goodness and many more things. In verse 25, it says, Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. It doesn't say why he went to look. i got several ideas. Any one of them glorifies God. It may be that he saw a training opportunity only. He said, hey, I need to get Saul into this. This is something that, that he needs to be a part of. Maybe it was he saw the whole scope of what was going on. He said, I can't handle this on my own. I need help. There's nothing wrong with saying you need help. If you say you need help, number one, you're allowing others to help you and let the Spirit fill them and use them as well. But you're also not restricting God by saying, I can do it on my own. 
And so many times we let I get in the way. For whatever reasons, Barnabas saw that he needed Saul. And he humbled himself. He didn't say, I can take care of this. He humbled himself and took the trip and got Saul. And God did want to use Saul. That's the whole reason that he called Saul. He said, you will be my hands and feet. And you will suffer for my name. I don't know how much Paul was doing before this because the Scriptures don't really tell us again. But this is the birthing of Saul when Barnabas took the time that he saw a spirit-filled young man and he took the effort that it took, the guts that it took, to go get him and prepare him for ministry. Verse 26, And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. So what job did he give him? He gave him a job co-pastoring so that one day he could become lead pastor, right? Verse 27, During this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them named Abagus stood up and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. The disciples, each according to his ability, decided to provide help for the brothers living in Judea. This they did, sending their gifts to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. Barnabas has already done a lot. When we serve, we think, hey, I've served a little bit. Maybe I can have some rest and relaxation for what I want and for what I need. Not Barnabas. He knew those things didn't matter. He got rid of them early on in his life. He knew the next step was whatever God called him. God would supply him with the rest that he needed. Would supply him with the abilities that he needed. And he was ready to go. And guess what? He was trustworthy. He was filled up with the Spirit. And off he went again. Verse. Then we move on Excuse me, to Acts 12, verse 25. When Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, they returned from Jerusalem, taking with them John, also called Mark. They were trustworthy. They got the job done. And now, here's another training opportunity, isn't it? We see another young disciple coming along beside Barnabas to be trained. What does the Great Commission tell us? It tells us to go and preach and teach the gospel message. And then what? Somebody? Make disciples. So many times we forget that. That's what he's doing because he knows he can't do everything. And if he trains this person and this person, and they train this person, and this person. Look at the growth that the gospel message can have. So he brought Mark with him. They returned home to do what? To sit and do nothing? No, to refuel, to get further instructions from the Spirit. We're going to skip to chapter 13, verses 1 through 4. In the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menean, who had, who had brought up with him Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. His company of disciples is growing, isn't it? While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work for which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them sent on their way by the Holy Spirit. He was off and running again. Not for what he wanted, but for God's glory, for God's work. There was work to be done. Oh, and in the world we live in today, there's plenty of work to be done. Just read the news. See how far we're turning from God, especially in this country. And we have 80% of the assets in this world in the industrialized countries while people are out starving and don't have running water. We need to be their hands and feet. Jesus has called us to do that. And it was a command, not a suggestion. Barnabas knew this. He realized his purpose in life. And in Ephesians 4, 11 through 13, Paul talks a little bit about that. He says, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. Why? To equip them for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. And that hasn't changed. Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That's what he recognized. That's what he lived by. 
Let's skip down to verse, verses 7 through 9 in Acts 13. Sergius Paulus, the proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from their faith. Then Saul, who was called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elymas and said, Here we have the birth of Paul. He's been trained up by a godly man, by a man who lived the word of God as well as spoke the word of God. And Barnabas sees this, and he steps aside. He steps on for further ministry. He lets Paul go on his own and take the lead. He still travels with him. He's still in the picture. But from here you see it, Paul and Barnabas. He knows when the Holy Spirit is calling someone else. And he gladly, humbly steps aside. And sometimes that's hard for us to do. Because we don't know what God has next for us. But God wants to use us while we still have breath left in our lungs. He has a plan for us. Whether it's preaching the Word of God directly or mentoring someone else. Whatever that may be. Whatever capacity you can serve in. God calls you to a life of service until you have no life anymore. So he steps aside and we read on in chapter 14, verses 3 through 7. That's the next time we hear about Barnabas. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there speaking boldly for the Lord, who confirmed the message of His grace by enabling them to do miraculous signs and wonders. And sometimes we forget about that. The Holy Spirit can do mighty, wonderful things through you. You've got to be obedient. You've got to let Him. There's no restrictions placed upon Him. Verse 4, The people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews, others with the apostles. There was a plot afoot among the Gentiles and Jews, together with their leaders, to mistreat them and stone them. But they found out about it and fled to Laconian cities of Lystra and Derbe and to the surrounding country where they continued to preach the news, good news. They spent the time that it took. They knew that this was a spiritual battle. They knew that Satan would attack them and even threaten their lives. And they had the spiritual discernment to flee when they needed to flee. But did they flee and go coward somewhere? They saw it as another opportunity to preach. That's so awesome. Let's keep reading. Verses 11 through 15. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Laconian language, The gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes, because he was a chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temples was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates, because he and the crowds wanted to offer sacrifices to them. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of this, they tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd, shouting, Men, why are you doing this? We, are t- we too are only men, human like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God, who made heaven and earth and sea and everything in them. Kind of reminds me when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. Satan threw at them, hey, here's a chance for you to be gods. And they didn't want any part of it. They were mighty men in the eyes of these people and could have ran with that, but they humbly and fearfully knew who their God and Lord was. And they turned the focus right back to the salvation message of Jesus Christ. They didn't falter. If Satan threatened them with their life or threatened them with gains of worldly desires, they still boldly preached the gospel. Verses 21 through 23, they preached the good news in the city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of heaven, they said. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders from them in in their church and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. They went on strengthening, teaching, and encouraging. They were able to see fruits of their labor and that encouraged them that much more. And they encouraged the believers to even endure hardships. With Christianity, there will be hardships. We will suffer in Christ's name. We haven't suffered a lot. We've been blessed. I don't know what sufferings are in store for me or you or anyone else. But will you be able to stand firm during that suffering and give God the glory that He deserves? Barnabas did. 
In Acts 15, we'll look at verse 1 and 2, and then 12 and 22. So we're going to skip a little bit. There's so many verses, I tried to condense them as much as I can, but there's just so much good stuff here on Barnabas. Verse 1, Some men came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the brothers, Unless you are circumcised according to the customs taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debated with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed along with some other believers to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and the elders about the question. Verse 12, The whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul, telling about the miraculous signs and wonders that God had done among the Gentiles through them. Then the apostles and elders with the whole church, verse 22, I'm sorry, when the apostles and elders and the whole church decided to choose some of their own men and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. Look how people followed these men. There's something about their characteristics and trait. They didn't just preach the Word. They lived the Word, and it was evident. It was evident that the Spirit filled them. They were able to face hypocrisy in the church, and they were able to talk to men, and they changed. They didn't divide out and start another denomination. They faced it, and they met together. And they said, this is what we need to do. They recognized the truth, and they taught it dynamically, boldly, with confidence in the Spirit. And they preached unity rather than division. Now we're going to wrap up the Scripture reading. Acts 15, verses 35 through 39. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, where they, ha- where they and many others taught and preached the word of the Lord. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us go back and visit the brothers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Follow up. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul did not think it was wise to take them, because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in their work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus. God is a God, I said it earlier and I'll say it again, of second chances, third chances, fourth chances. Don't test Him though. But He wants you. He wants you to come to Him. You cannot do a sin that He will not forgive you for. You cannot... Sin repeatedly and Him not forgive you if you will come and humbly bow before Him and ask forgiveness. The only sin that you can do that will keep you from becoming a Christian is rejecting the Holy Spirit when He comes to you and says, Will you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior? That will condemn you. But no other sin that you have will condemn you. God is a God of second and third chances. And Barnabas saw the chances, and gave them to Mark. And Mark matured as a result. He went back to train. He went back to teach. He didn't stop his journey there. The only reason we don't hear about him as much is because God wanted to use Paul in a mighty way. He was the one that destroyed the faith, and now he was going to build the faith. Barnabas went on. We don't know as much. We have to get it from history where we can. But what Christian tradition is, is he later traveled to Rome where he was perhaps the first to teach the gospel message there. We don't know the exact date or time or circumstances of his death, but however, it's tradition that he was martyred at Salamis, Cyprus in 61 AD. He was supposedly preaching in the synagogues. They got enraged, took him out, and stoned him. And John Mark witnessed it. John Mark was not defeated. Instead, he went on. Paul continued on. Death was victory, not defeat. There used to be a day when Christians were excited to, to work for the church. They would volunteer. They would make themselves available. They would serve wherever there was need. But today, we're just too busy. We're working for the weekend and our nights and are just too busy. On Monday night, we watch football. On Tuesday night, we can't miss the voice on TV. On Wednesday night, we have karate class. On Thursday night, we have the ball game at school. Friday night is the only night we have to go to a movie or go out to eat. Saturday is the only day we have to work around the house, and then, man, I am beat. So Sunday rolls around, and I'm tired. It takes a lot of effort and sacrifice to go to church, so maybe I'll just sleep in just this once. After all, we're just busy people. No time to witness, no time to pray with people, no time for other church functions, 
No time to invite someone to church. No time to visit the sick. Not even time to call and check on someone in need. No time to be a Christian in the church. That's my challenge today. I challenge you to go back. I know I read a lot. I just took the verses in Acts. There are more references to Barnabas in the Bible. I challenge you to look at the man's character traits and see how God used him in a mighty way. That he trained up others who spread the gospel further. He truly lived out the Great Commission. He repented. He had faith. He got rid of anything that stood in his way. He served with all of his heart, mind, body, and soul. And he studied, prayed, and continually sought God's will and allowed the Spirit to fill him and use him over and over again. He served and served till he died, till he used every last breath. What a sweet fragrance to God. And we can pattern our lives after that. So here's the experiment part. I dare you and challenge you to go look at at least one of his character traits. And while we're doing the Bible study in Acts, and hopefully it will become a habit and you'll do it longer, take that character trait and go apply it that week. So you say, well, what are some of those things? Well, for example, fast. Stand up for someone else. Give to missions. Get rid of that sin that's been keeping you from God. Volunteer in some way for church service. Invite someone to a movie night. Especially share the gospel message of Jesus Christ. There's so many things that you can see from Barnabas' life. If you'll start by applying just one, then we can do an experiment and see how well this works and what the results will be in our church. Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you so much for your word and thank you for the examples of the true heroes in the Bible. Whether they stand out or don't stand out, Father, we can learn so much from them. And Father, I thank you for the example of Barnabas. It is truly encouraging, inspiring, how he stood up for you no matter what. And Father, I pray that for this church. I pray, Father, that we get the heart that looks at people through Jesus' eyes, that every single person matters. And we are the vessels, we are the hands and feet by which the gospel message should be spread. Let us bring hope and light to a world that needs you so desperately. We just thank you and praise you. May we be your obedient, faithful servants. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.